let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, today is Friday, um, February 14th, 2003, and this is the beginning of an interview with Staff Sergeant George Blackwelder and, um, at the Jamal Valley Historical Society in Elmira, New York. Uh, my name is Ellen Lipanski. I'll be the interviewer. Uh, I am a volunteer with the Historical Society. And uh, Sergeant Blackwelder, would you state for the recording your date of birth, and your current address, and what war and branch of service you, you uh, served in? What was your rank? Okay, uh, I'm Staff Sergeant Blackwelder. I'm currently in the Air Force, and I live at Four Dreams South and Painted Post in New York. And I was born February 1st, 1971. And your branch of service in your war? Uh, during Desert Storm, I was in the Air Force. Still currently in the Air Force. And you are an Air Force recruit? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you enlisted in the Air Force before Desert Storm, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What caused you to enlist? What were you doing with that service? Well, um, as a child growing up, I always thought about a branch of the military. Um, and then throughout my high school years, I checked into each one of them because I always had the philosophy of you don't buy the first car you see at a used car lot or you don't go with the first college that you submit the college uh, you know, referral to. And, um, so I just checked into each one of the different branches and the Air Force seemed to be the one that was going to give me the most opportunities and the most benefits for what I was looking for at the time. Um, I really wanted college, but I really didn't want to have to go to college. So that was something that the Air Force was looking at giving to me. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to afford college unless I you know, had a job and those kind of things. And I knew that the Air Force was going to let me do a job and allow me to still go back to college at the same time. So that was pretty much my decision. Uh, plus I knew that I wanted to do the, the war you know, dreams that I had as a child of putting on the camouflage uniform and going out in the woods and that kind of stuff. So I felt that the Air Force was going to give me that, that opportunity without me having to be like a main fighting force in war constantly, and I knew that the Air Force was going to be good for a family type of fire. Um, when did you enlist in the Air Force? I uh, was down in Savannah, Georgia, and a recruiter came and talked to me at my high school, and, uh, and that was at Windsor Forest High School. and. He really didn't have to sell me on it because I'd already talked to the other branches of service and I, I uh, had already done a little bit of research on the Air Force. And so whenever I asked him, you know, I had a long list of questions I had to ask him and he answered each one of the questions uh, that I had for him. And my mom, you know, she went with me and asked a bunch of questions. So he was very good about answering the questions and then you know, he helped me out. He got me in the, in the door and sent me up to the processing center. And uh, October the 3rd of 1989, I went into uh, basic training. What was your experience in basic training? Oh, <laughs> wow. That. that was uh, <laughs> six weeks of fun. That just, the, the whole basic training experience was... A lot of people were scared and, and they didn't know what was going to happen to them next and that's part of basic training is it's the ultimate surprise of where they transition uh, young men and women from civilian way of life to a military way of life uh, and the Air Force, um, we we learned a lot, uh, we went through a lot of scholastic 
uh, information that we had learned, background information about the Air Force. Um, we did a lot of exercising, early morning exercising. Uh, there was quite a few times I'd, I'd wake up in the morning, we'd be out there doing our jumping jacks, and I'm looking around like, the sun's not even up, what are we doing up, you know? And uh, that kind of thing, but I mean, overall, they kept us busy, and they kept us motivated, and they kept us going, and we got a lot of training in those six weeks. Um, and I noticed the change, not only my parents, but I noticed the change in myself that I went from this guy that liked to wear blue jeans and t-shirts, you know, and now I'm saluting and I'm standing tall and I'm wearing a nice crisp uniform. So, I mean, it, it was a major change for me to see. Uh, my body went through a lot of changes because your eating habits change, uh, your study habits change, your sleeping habits change. So overall, the six weeks of basic training is really, really uh, centered and focused on getting you to the point to where no matter what you face in life, you'll be able to make it through it. And that's the uh, training instructor's job there, is to make sure that each individual becomes a team member and actually can make it through anything that they face in life. And, and through my years of experience in the Air Force since basic training, I've learned that that six weeks of basic training is key in, in that fact. That no matter what I've done in the, in the Air Force, I've always been able to make it through it no matter what because of that training. <clears throat> so how long did, after you enlisted did you go to uh, go overseas into the world? Okay, I, uh, or are there any experiences before that that are important to you? Okay. Um, I enlisted in October the 3rd of 1989. How old were you? Uh, I was 17 when I first signed the paperwork, so of course mom and dad had to sign the paperwork. Um, in 89, or actually October the 3rd of 89, I started basic training. Six weeks after that, around the middle of November, I went to our technical training school out in Denver, Colorado. And Air Force I Academy. learned Air Force. Academy. Did you go to the academy? No, ma'am. Uh, basically, it was a technical training school for my job that I was going to be doing, which was munitions. And uh, that was another six weeks of training. And I had a lot of fun in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> um, we were training, but, you know, we still had our afternoons and our weekends that we could do what we wanted to. And uh, I remember one weekend we went to a ski resort. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, Keystone. Keystone Ski Resort for the weekend. And it was just a bunch of us guys, you know, getting together, having fun on the ski slopes. And that was a good break in our training that, you know, we were allowed to go do that. Um, but during that six weeks of uh, technical training, we were learning a lot of information. Um, basically, we were learning everything that we needed to know about our job so that whenever we went to our first duty station we could actually do our job with the basic skills that we learned in our tech school. Um, hit the ground running. <laughs> and it basically hit the ground running. Um, but the Air Force training overall is a lot better than that because right after graduating tech school whenever I went to my first duty station I actually got more on-the-job training where uh, a trainer sat down with me one-on-one -on -one and we used the tools that I was actually going to use in my job and we did the job. He was right there over my shoulder the whole time showing me how, uh, say, to put a fin assembly on to the munitions and tighten down the, the screws and everything and, and every, every step of the way he was showing me uh, what size tool to use, what kind of tool to use and that kind of thing, showing me in our tech manuals uh, what page to turn to, how to read the tech manuals, uh, 
how to do it step by step according to the manuals. Um, so during that on the job training, I learned a lot of information that normally if you just try to read it into a book and then go try to do it on your own, you're not going to be able to do it. So um, that was a key step in the learning process of being able to, to have the technical manuals there, the item that you're working on, and somebody that's done that step before that can sit there and, and tell you what you're doing wrong and help you and point it out in a tech manual what you need to do step by step. So after basic training and tech school, uh, I graduated technical training in January because we got a Christmas break. I got to go home for two weeks for Christmas. That was awesome. Uh, and that was the first time that my parents had seen me after I left. So for them to see me standing tall in uniform, uh, wearing the uh, blues, they were just very proud of me, uh, especially over Christmas time frame. My mom just couldn't take enough pictures of me, you know, that kind of thing, because she was so proud. Um, and then after technical training, I went to Myrtle Beach Air Force Base. Uh, I'll never forget um, the in processing at Myrtle Beach was just totally different than what I ever imagined of, of, a, of an Air Force type situation. The commander came in, he introduced himself and every you know everybody stood up to attention and he was like be seated, be seated and it was a very relaxed environment and he talked to us like he was talking to us as an individual and that was my first experience at higher ranking uh, personnel and that just made me feel so comfortable that you know I thought that it was going to be kind of like basic training that you know this guy's going to come walking and start barking out orders and we're going to be standing at attention the whole time but it was just so relaxed and that made me realize that the Air Force was the branch that you know I was happy that I joined um, because everybody just treats you normal. They treat you like you're a person one-on-one. -on -one. So um, after the end processing at Myrtle Beach, I went through my on-the-job training where I was learning uh, each step of the process of how to do uh, certain jobs. And I was with an, an A-10 attack aircraft unit. It's, uh, we called it the Warthog because it was just this ugly looking tank that basically they built the tank, the, the aircraft around the gun. So it's this huge 30 millimeter cannon gun on the front of it. And whenever, <coughs> whenever it flies, if you're not going a little bit full throttle and you fire that weapon, it'll actually s slow the aircraft down. That's how powerful of a gun it is on the front end of it. So. For me to see this aircraft, I'm like, that's kind of weird looking aircraft for the Air Force. You know, I'm thinking uh, all these pictures that you see of the, the fighter aircraft like the F-16, the F-15. You're thinking of this nice slick gray aircraft and you see this big green, you know, funny looking aircraft sitting out on the runway and you're like, I didn't know we had this kind of stuff. So. Um, that was an experience in itself, uh, learning the different munitions that that aircraft could carry. I mean, it could carry all kind of stuff, uh, rockets, flares, uh, all kind of different countermeasures, just a lot of everything. And uh, that gave me a lot of great job experience in the initial uh, avenues of, of my learning process because I learned most of of the munitions that we we wouldn't ever need to learn within that first duty station. So whenever uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait and we were watching it on the news, we knew that because of the area and because of the amount of tanks and forces that Iraq had, that our unit was going to get deployed. We knew that. We just had that gut feeling. So. Um, I really couldn't you know, like call and tell anybody that I was going, so basically I, I called my parents and once I got the definite word that, that our unit was going, 
I knew there was a lot of people in my unit that were married. And I'm like, I really don't want to see them get separated from their family. And me being single and just starting a career in the Air Force, I was like, I'll go. So I volunteered to go, um, even though the actual squadron that I was working for was not tasked to go at the time. But I volunteered to go in place of one of the married guys that had children. So um, I got the notification that we had two weeks to pack our bags, get ready, uh, and we were going to get deployed. So first thing I did, I called up mom and dad. I said, look, I need to see you. I can't explain why. Just, if you could, please get here. And uh, luckily that weekend they were able to make a trip there, and I got to see both of my parents and my sister, and I hugged them, and we kidded around. You know, I, I took my, uh, my helmet that is part of our war gear. I put it on my sister. We took pictures of it because it came way down to here, you know, and uh, just overall uh, my parents knew that it was something that I had to do and it was something that I really wanted to do. So they didn't have a problem with it and they knew that I had volunteered. So uh, overall they had a good feeling about it. They knew uh, that everything was going to be fine. That by the training that I had received that nothing was going to happen to me. Uh, and that I had plenty of friends and supervisors that were going to look out for me. So whenever we deployed to Desert Storm, I'll never forget, um, I got off the plane. It was 3 in the morning. And we stepped off that plane. And I looked at my watch. I had a watch that had a temperature gauge on it, and it said 105 degrees. I was like, whew. Man, it, it's not going to be good whenever that sun comes up the next morning if it's 105 now and it's 3 in the morning. So uh, that was a major different experience for me uh, because I'd always grown up uh, in the south, kind of like South Carolina and Georgia area. So I never really got to travel any other place uh, other than, you know, basic training and my technical training. So to see this other country and to get off the plane and heat and the difference in the temperature and just it was a weird experience um and i'll never forget the second day we were walking around doing our uh, tent building detail and because we had to build a place for us to live <laughs> and uh i remember my mom saying to pack some sunblock so i packed some 55 sunblock and here I am trying to put this stuff on the next day. I squirted it in my hand. I went to put it on. It turned to powder. I was like, well, that doesn't do any good. <laughs> because the heat there is a dry heat, and it just sucked the moisture right out of the, uh, the sunscreen. So uh, that's why if you ever see pictures of people in Desert Storm, you see them with long sleeve shirts on. And that's why. is because the sunblock... You, you just can't put it on. It, it just evaporates. So what we were doing was leaving our sleeves rolled down. You would think it makes you hotter, but it actually doesn't. It provides like a, a air circulation type zone uh, to your skin, so it actually keeps you cooler by keeping your sleeves down. So uh, a lot of us were, you know, because of the, the munitions that we were working on, they were metal. So they get super hot in the heat so we were having to walk around with leather gloves on most of the time sleeves rolled down you know and it was just it was a weird environment for us overall um i i rarely ever drank water you know but over there you had to drink at least two or three bottles of water and i mean the big bottles of water a day just to keep yourself hydrated because of how dry of a heat it is um and there were a lot of people that overall, they thought they were drinking enough water but weren't, so they'd get dehydrated and we'd have to take them to the hospital, that kind of stuff. So overall, um, they were looking out for us. They were making sure uh, the medics there were constantly keeping on us about drinking the water. Um, so overall, our experience was great because, you know, um, we. We were watching out for each other. If we seen one of our buddies get kind of flushed, we were like, hey man, you need to drink some water, you know, get them some water. Uh, we were getting Gatorade to some of the people. Uh, 
even the, the guys that had like guard duty and were having to stand out in the middle of the sh uh, shack in the middle of the runway waiting. Uh, we made sure they were getting hot meals. We were making sure they were getting water, uh, plenty of stuff like that. So uh, we always looked out for each other and our supervisors looked out for us too. So. And then, uh, you talked about your arrival. What was your job over there? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> I had many different jobs while I was in Desert Storm. Uh, the first job that I ever had was we had to receive in all the different munitions that, that we needed to build up to have a good fighting force over there. And how they were coming in originally was by aircraft and then they'd get put on trucks and then the trucks would deliver them to us. Well, we were having to download 40-foot tractor trailer trucks of munitions and we were working 12-hour shifts seven days a week. So in that 12-hour shifts, we weren't working steady for 12 hours, but we would like work really hard for about three or four hours while we were trying to download all the trucks that arrived and then the trucks would leave and we would have the downtime uh, you know it would be a couple of hours before the next set of trucks would come in so we would make sure that the munitions were put right on the pad and then we would go take a break we would you know get water uh, a couple of us would play cards you know because that's about the only thing no TV so you had to play cards um, and I learned how to play spades and hearts and all kind of fun games. But, uh, and then we would get the next set of trucks in and then we'd start loading or unloading those trucks. And so that first job, I basically drove a forklift or I spotted a forklift most of the time. And that, I, I really got a lot of practice. Uh, it got to the point to where I could actually pick up two stacks of items and then put them onto a pad and and put them right in place within inches of each other. And you know the spotter's right there, and he's spotting me in, but it's partially my being able to move it in the place at the same time. So for me to be able to get it within an inch of either direction very quickly with the spotter guiding me in, that's fairly good. Because most of the time the spotter has to tell you, you know, come left a little bit, come right a little <laughs> bit, you know, and get it right in there to where you can get it in place. But most of the time he was just, you know, come on in, come on in, yep, good. So um, for me to get that experience, that helped out, uh, especially early in my career. Then after getting all the munitions in place that we needed to, then it came time to inspecting them, making sure that they were combat ready. Um, a lot of the missile systems that we got in, we actually had to take them uh, apart and take the guidance section and hook it up to a missile uh, test set so that we can make sure that it made it okay in the shipment and nothing's damaged and everything's good to go so that whenever it is put on the aircraft, it will fire the first time around. So uh, that was my job for, I think, about two months. Uh, that's all I did was tested missiles. And I remember personally testing over 100-and-something missiles uh, within that two-month time frame. And overall, that's basically what got me my first achievement medal was the fact that I was able to test, repair, or uh, fix any problems that happened to the, to the missiles during shipment and put them back in servicing order so that they would be combat ready. And I did all of that uh, in a very short time frame um, because we knew that we didn't have long you know, before we were actually going to need some of those items. And then I also started a program and a tracking board that allowed us to continually test those missiles to make sure that they were still in, in combat ready because sitting out there uh, in the heat and the weather and, and all of this, we want to make sure that they were still good to go so that when we did load them up on the aircraft, no problems whatsoever. The pilot knew with confidence that he could use it. Um, 
that was the second job I had. And then um, I volunteered again <laughs> to go you up to the. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. You can volunteer for something. Um, again, I, I volunteered to go up to what we call the forward operating location for the Air Force. Um, this was a staging point that was a little bit further uh, forward than the base that I was at originally. And what this allowed us to do was our aircraft didn't have to fly as far to be able to meet their mission capabilities. And it gave us time to be able to build up a base so that we could turn the aircraft a lot quicker. So that we didn't have to wait for them to fly all the way back put new stuff on them and then fly uh, back out to do their mission. This allowed us that we knew they were constantly going to be coming in and we could reload them a lot quicker. Um, at this base, basically I was what they called the round robin crew. Whatever needed to be done, <laughs> my crew went out and did that. Um, and my supervisor at the time, he was an awesome guy. Uh, he he treated us with the utmost respect and he made sure that we were all taken care of. He called us our little kitties, you know, and it, he, uh, he kind of felt like a, a big daddy or a big brother watching after all of us. And our crew, what we would have to do is if a, a pilot asked for a certain type of munition, we would have to go get it and take it out to that aircraft and make sure that he had that right munition. And uh, there were a lot of times that, that he, my supervisor, was right there next to me because some of the stuff I'd never even seen before. And for me to sit there and we had to change some of the settings on some of the items and, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And he was right there showing me how to do it. And once he showed me how to do it, I had no problem. You know, I could do whatever I needed. and. Uh, there were times that we'd drive out to a pad and I'm just looking at this pad going, we got to do all that? <laughs> you know, that's a lot of stuff. And uh, we would get it done fairly quick. I mean, it, it would surprise me how quickly we could actually do uh, some of the work because we were motivated. We knew that we had to get it done and, and, and uh, that was our mission. That, you know, we had to get all of this stuff built up and out to the flight line. So um, a lot of the things that we did over there and built up in a normal situation you wouldn't expect to be able to build that many items or, or get that much stuff out to the aircraft that quickly but because we knew that it had to be done. We met all kind of requirements that you normally under normal training conditions because you're having to show somebody how to do something um, would not be able to do. So how we worked it over there is if you knew how to do something really well and you were really fast at it then you volunteered and you went and did that item. Um, there were a lot of different things that we had to build up and if I knew how to do it I was like hey boss I'll do it I'm pretty quick at doing it you know and I'd get to, to going really fast and he's like alright you're on it so, you know, then he'd find somebody else to do another job that they could do really fast. So that's how we were able to do that uh, so quickly and build up so many different items uh, so fast and get them out to the flight line. Um, Sounds like teamwork. Oh, yeah. It, it, outstanding teamwork. I mean, uh, to the point to where if somebody was getting behind, and I was way ahead at my job position, I would actually go out and help out the next guy, you know, and help him get caught up to where I could go back to my job and then keep us going on a steady pace to where we never got behind. And uh, that was the job that I had then. And then uh, my next job, I'll never forget this. Um, we were, since I was at the forward operating location, we were prone to uh, attacks from uh, Iraq and uh, this one time we were redoing uh, the 30 millimeter munitions for the for the aircraft it's what we call a combat load it's a mixed load that you have to pull certain rounds out and replace them to where 
you had a set number of types of different rounds. And I'll never forget, I grabbed the, uh, the spool of the rounds and I went to run out with them and try to get the, the line out to where we could go down the, the row of, of bullets and pull out each one that was already fired and put in a good one. And whenever I went running across with it, we noticed this big bright light on the horizon. This looked like a firework almost. And we were like, what in the world? Boom! We were like, that ain't no flare. <laughs> we went running toward the bunker and we threw on the gas mask and all this stuff. So uh, that, was a, that was a very learning experience for all of us. Uh, and the <laughs> fact that, so. that uh, we never knew what to expect. And that was the good part about it is through our, our hard training and basic training, uh, we knew what to do. It wasn't like we were just sitting there going, what do we do? You know, no, uh, you know, that explosion went off. So, you know, here we are. We threw that gas mask on and was booking it toward the bunker. Um, so our training paid off in the fact that we didn't have to sit there and think, oh, what do we do? we actually just reacted and we went and did what we were taught to do um, and I truly believe that that's what helped a lot of us out there in Desert Storm was that we didn't have to sit there and think through all the training that we'd received in basic training and through our Air Force uh, experience that we just reacted we just did what we were taught to do and uh, that's why throughout the whole time in Desert Storm I never seen anybody get injured I never seen anybody get killed. We all made it back alive, no problem. So, for our training to be able to do that for us was outstanding. Um, up at the front line, my job changed a lot, but overall, um, it was great experiences. I, I learned a lot about my job uh, overall, and I would not trade it for anything. <laughs> oh wow. Um, what really helped me strive for the medals and the decorations and volunteering to go off to war, I'd always admired watching uh, gentlemen on TV, you know, and uh, there was one show I remember, a gentleman was named Chesty because of how many medals he had up there. I mean, they went way up here. And um, I was very proud of that. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And whew. at the time that I joined, my grandfather had cancer. Okay, um, my grandfather at the time had cancer and I wanted to make him proud. I wanted to come back and say, look what I've done. And during Desert Storm, I volunteered to do a lot of stuff that normally I probably wouldn't have. And I enjoyed doing it. And whenever I came back, and I had, I didn't have a lot, but I had a few medals. 
And my grandfather was so proud of me. And that's why I, I just strive every day to do more and more. Because me and him were really close. He'd always wanted to be, and he was with the Savannah Railroad. And because his parents were uh, no longer alive, and he was in an orphanage type home situation, he could not be in uh, a branch of the military. So for him, it was kind of his way of doing it through me. So I want to make him proud. And whenever I got back from the other storm, I constantly got asked that question, what are those rhythms for? <laughs> and it felt good to sit there and explain that, you know, um, we helped another nation out. Uh, Kuwait was overrun by Iraq and the United States Air Force and uh, a lot of different coalition forces we went over and we actually were able to get Kuwait back for the local Kuwaitis and by doing so the Kuwaiti government and the Saudi Arabian government gave us a medal for it as long as we were part of that force and our A-10 force, our A-10 attack force uh, was a major part of that. We were actually flying missions in there and, and bombing cer certain sites in that area and uh, that helped push the enemy back. Uh, it helped push Iraq back to where we could get our forces in there and, and clean up and be able to take the town back over so that Kuwaitis could, you know, enjoy their nation again. And the first one here is the one that the Kuwaiti government gave us. This is the Kuwaiti Liberation Medal from Kuwait. And then this one is the Kuwaiti Liberation Medal from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And that's, you know, uh, how I got <coughs> both of those. And of course, this is our basic training ribbon. That everybody that graduates basic training is allowed to wear that ribbon. The green uh, ribbon is marksman ribbon. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, I had to shoot 38 rounds out of 40 rounds on target to be able to get marksman. And that's what I was able to do for that, for the uh, M16 rifle. I missed 9mm uh, handgun. I missed that by one point. You had to shoot 40 out of 40, and I got 39 out of 40. So, uh, And then that's my uh, promotion uh, fitness examination, or uh, PME ribbon, we call it. Uh, basically, what I had to do was learn uh, what I needed to know to be a supervisor in the Air Force for my Staff Sergeant Stripe. Um, I had to learn leadership, uh, how to do a feedback, uh, basically telling them how their performance is going, how to rate them uh, in what we call our EPRs, or Enlisted Performance Reports, uh, basically all the stuff that it takes to be a supervisor and to be a leader uh, for the Air Force. And then this ribbon I just recently earned, that's a recruiting ribbon, so that's, that's a plus. <laughs> I need a tissue person. And two attachments, or recruitments we call them. Um, it means that I've been in over 12 years by showing that. And then this is the Air Force Long Tour Ribbon. Uh, I got that for doing three years in Okinawa, Japan. That was a very wonderful experience. Um, I got to do a lot of diving uh, during that time. Period. 
And then uh, this was one of the other ribbons that I received during Desert Storm. It's called the Short Tour Ribbon. It's because I was in country more than 211 days, or over 180 days is for the requirement. I was there for 211 days. And then uh, after Desert Storm, I went to Korea, so I got another ribbon for that because I was in Korea for a year. So that was a really wonderful experience. I got to learn some of the language and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then that's the Southwest Asia Service Medal. Basically, uh, with the three stars on there, it means that I went through three different operations. I went through Operation Desert Shield, Operation Desert Storm, and then Operation Desert Rainbow, which meant that was pretty much the cleanup or the after effects of Desert Storm. So I was there for all three, all at one time. And then this is the Air Expeditionary Force Medal. Um, I received that for going back to the desert area the second time around. So I actually went back. And uh, this medal was given for outstanding service in that area. Um, basically, I did above and beyond what my normal job required me to do. And then this is the National Defense Medal. The first one I received was from Desert Storm. And then with the star, the second one was from September the 11th. Because at the time I was uh, at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base and we flew, our aircraft flew support over the Pentagon and over the Twin Tower area after the attacks. And then the Air Force Good Conduct Medal, uh, the ribbon plus three devices counts as four, uh, and that's three years of good conduct. And as long as you don't do anything bad, you get the three years, uh, every three years you get a con good conduct. So that tells you that I've been in over 12 years also. And then this is the Outstanding Unit Award. The reason why there are two of the same ribbon is because I have so many different Outstanding Unit Awards, but I don't have enough to have a silver device. It's actually three, four, five outstanding unit awards, which I've received one during Desert Storm, and that's why I have the V there is because our unit won Valor in combat. We were the, we were the unit that took the most uh, combat uh, sorties, and we flew the most uh, sortie as a mission uh, we flew the most combat missions, and we destroyed the most amount of uh, enemy forces. So overall, uh, I have a lot of the outstanding units. I've been in a, a lot of great units uh, that were afforded me that opportunity to be able to get outstanding units. And then there's the Achievement Medal, which I have three. I got one during Desert Storm, one during my year in Korea, and then one while I was in uh, Saudi Arabia the second time around. Because at the time, our munitions were getting low and we needed to order uh, more munitions and that was my job at the time. So what I did was I made sure that we ordered enough munitions that would get there in time to keep us above mission capability. So that no matter what, even if we had to break out into a war, which did happen while I was there, and that was Desert Fox, um, that we had enough munitions to be able to cover that time frame. And that's why they were able to give me the achievement medal for that is because it wasn't part of my normal job to make sure that we had more than enough. But I went on ahead and did that, and I got them. I got the munitions there in enough time to where we had more than what we needed. And then the accommodation medal. I got that from uh, doing the three, the three years in Okinawa, Japan. Basically because of all the different things that I did at that base, uh, I volunteered uh, a lot. I helped out with uh, snorkel and dive trips with local elementary schools. Um, I was part of what we call the Reef Rovers Club where we went out and we cleaned up the different uh, beaches. We actually went out on our weekends off and cleaned up the trash around the beach and stuff like that. Um, and not only that, my actual job. 
I, I made a tracking program that would track all the munitions coming in and going out of that base. Uh, and, and it was 100% accountability. That was something that they hardly ever had before because sometimes you don't even get a notice of something coming in. You just get the phone call, hey, it's here. What's here? So uh, basically from my tracking program to change that around to where we had 100% accountability for everything coming in and going out, that was what helped me get the medal. So overall, by displaying this, it tells people that I didn't only do my job, I went above and beyond my job, and I sacrificed a lot of personal uh, time and, 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 and abilities to be able to do that. Like I was saying, the volunteering on weekends and, and stuff like that, that was something that I always felt strongly about. Would you get a comment on Rainbow Desert Fox? Um, the Desert Rainbow was uh, basically the time frame that we were there was for us to just make sure that what we had already done in Desert Storm was cleaned up. I mean, so it was it was part of the war, but it was it was uh, more along the less of us packing up and going home. Um, it was it was part of us getting the forces back together. Um, whatever bases that we had set up that were temporary, it was to tear them down and, and bring everything back to where we were originally stationed at and to be able to just be ready to go back home. So um, as far as part of the war aspect of Desert Rainbow, um, that was whenever our ground forces went in and actually made sure that whatever bunkers you know, were, were around, we wanted to make sure they were clean and nothing was in them. And our aircraft flew support for that in the fact that we wanted to make sure whatever tanks were sitting out there that they didn't cause any problems toward our ground forces. So uh, overall, the whole rainbow was just, you know, what we call our clean up, clean up to go home kind of deal. Um, Desert Fox. Um, to a lot of people, they don't even know what happened. Um, there is very little bit of information about it, and basically all, all that happened during Desert Fox was we were covering the northern and the southern no-fly zone for the Iraqi area, and um, one of our aircraft was targeted by uh, a rocket and, and uh, radar area on the ground. Well, when he got targeted, we, uh, we tried to do maneuvers, you know, or whatever to get out of the way, and uh, they still targeted our aircraft. So the president gave us permission and our fighter pilots took out the radar and the rocket towers. So that was, it was a quick war. Um, it was only like four days long. And a lot of people didn't even know, I mean, it, something was even happening. Um, and at that point in time, I was the one that had to sign off on the, uh, the expenditure or the usage of those missiles. So for me, I knew what was going on, um, but as far as everything else, uh, it's, it's written in Air Force history books and, and stuff like that as a four-day war, because that's all it was. It was just four days of us making sure that whatever was targeting our aircraft covering the, the no-fly zones was taken out, and that was it, and none of our None of our people had to actually participate in it other than the pilots. So, I mean, it was, it was the first war that I know of that was, you know, 
just strictly pilot based type air war. I mean, you know, as far as our ground forces having to go in, none of that happened. Check this thing. It seems to me it's yeah, been an hour, been, doesn't it? Been a while. I don't think it's been exactly an hour because we paused there for a little bit. Plus, I took about 20 minutes to do paperwork. It must be still going. Okay. We'll keep going. Should still Talk be kind of close. Up to Heather. <laughs> Should be in a minute, probably. Um. You you talked about. Uh, your experiences in Okinawa and uh, what did you say? Korea. Korea. So that's part of your life in the service. Oh yes, so ma'am. Um, and I want to see you. Okay. Um, my my experience is uh, I've been around the world three times. Uh, I can honestly say that. Um, <laughs> And it's not just because of what bases I've gone to, but because of the different temporary duties that I've volunteered for also. Um, Korea, Okinawa, Japan, um, those were my two favorite experiences, uh, not just because of where I was going, but because I had a lot of good you know, time that I could. for me because I got to see uh, the Asian area and, and totally different countries and I actually got to go downtown and interact with the local nationals in each one of those and in Korea because I got to go downtown and I got to talk to so many different people um, I learned a lot of the language I, I learned how to um, talk to like a taxi driver telling you know uh, where to turn, how to stop. Of course, that was a long time ago, and I probably don't remember <laughs> most of those. But um, I learned certain phrases, like um, how to say something tasted good, and that was masi so. You had to rub the belly because that was part of the uh, the language. Um, how to say hello, anya haseo. Uh, you know, and to uh, tell people that I understood. Uh, Korean, you know, it's Anna So Hangul. Um, so for me to learn all of this different stuff, it was, it was wonderful. Um, I got to see a lot of the Korean towns. I got to go to Seoul, Korea, and actually see where the Olympic Stadium was. Um, and to go downtown in uh, Osan City and to see Wendy's. <laughs> restaurant and Kentucky Fried Chicken and all these different types of restaurants downtown and it was actually written in Korean but you could tell by the picture and by the design that that was you know Wendy's you know Burger King all this stuff um, so it was great to actually interact with the uh, local nationals there now Korea uh, me and the, the friends would get down to go downtown together and we would go to the circuses to the zoos uh, we would go on mountain hiking expeditions caving stuff like that it was more of a more of a land type experience now going to okinawa japan it was more of an underwater experience <laughs> um, the visibility was pretty much a hundred foot all the time so the water was very very clear um, I have over 300 recreational log dives that I did while <coughs> while I was there. That's not counting any of the class dives that I did, and I work part time as a assistant instructor with my dive instructor. So a lot of those class dives that we did, I didn't count because they were you know just regular class dives. So probably overall, I have more than 600 dives in Okinawa, Japan. And my favorite ones were night dives. 
because so many animals and, and the color is just so wonderful at night because you use a flashlight and the flashlight actually brings out the color of the coral whereas during the day the sunlight barely gets down to the to the depths that we were going to so you really couldn't see the color I mean you could see the shape and you could see the the texture of the item but the color just really didn't stand out at night time use that, that big you know dive light and it made it like bright oranges bright reds and just outstanding color differences um, and it was a totally different atmosphere you had different animals out at night you had you know like your underwater nocturnal animals out uh, cuttlefish snakes sea snakes um, eels sea turtles all kind of stuff um, that during the day those are sleeping um, but during the day, you had all the nice colorful fish, like the parrotfish and uh, all your sunfish and, and stuff like that that have the different colors, your angelfish. So for me to be able to do both, it was just wonderful. Um, Did you attract much of the people in Oh, yeah. Um, I, I talked a lot with local nationals there. Um, I went into a lot of the different restaurants because, of course, uh, since I was 16 years old, I was always interested in the Asian type atmosphere. So I grew up knowing how to use chopsticks. Uh, so for me to be able to eat in a restaurant over there, they were all looking at me like, what's this American doing <laughs> using chopsticks so well, you know? And it was because I'd grown up uh, knowing how to use them. And um, I was willing to try all kind of different foods. And that made me stand out as an American because I was willing to try the cuttlefish and the squid and, the, you know, all the weird stuff that people, you know, are like, eh, I ain't trying that. But I was. I was willing to actually try the different types of seafood um, along with sushi and sushimi and all the different raw fish type categories. Um, of course, I love shrimp. So shrimp and lobster, and that was the best place to have that kind of stuff. Anything else that you have know, from other experiences around that influenced your life? Well, um, overall, I think my whole Air Force experience over the 13 years is just been outstanding. I, I've had many opportunities to make some great friends that I'm still in touch with and I mean it never fails. Um, I was making a trip out to Texas for some training and on the way back I had to stop in uh, I mean because you can't really drive from Texas back to North Carolina all in one day. <laughs> so um, part of the trip was I needed to spend the night in Louisiana. Well, a friend of mine was stationed there at Barstow Air Force Base. So I, on the way back, I called him up. I said, hey, Brian, you know, I'm, I'm coming through your area. You mind seeing me tonight? He's like, tonight? No problem. So we hung out and uh, we kind of got to spend a couple hours together there, you know, face to face and catch up on old times. Even though we were emailing back and forth, it was just an even better experience to sit there one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and to see the full circle uh, of my whole career, the original supervisor that I had at Myrtle Beach Air Force Base whenever I went to Desert Storm, I met up with him again in Seymour Johnson Air Force Base just before I came here. And it was wonderful to see him, and he looked at me, and he seen all the ribbons, and he seen the stripes, you know, he'd seen my rank, and he's just like, wow. Because whenever he knew me, I had hardly any stripes. I had like two or three ribbons, you know. <laughs> so for him to see my progress throughout my career was just wonderful. And uh, we caught up on a, a lot of old times, and we reminisced about what we did over there. Uh, I brought pictures of desert storm over to his house and we laughed about some of the stuff that we did uh, there was one time he got a forklift stuck in the mud so we sat there and <laughs> laughed about that I was like yeah I didn't see that happen and uh, you know just overall we had a we had a wonderful experience um, 
and part of that catching up was some of the pictures of some of the things that we did while we were over there and um, this hat we call the floppy hat was one of the ones that I had to wear in a desert storm because it kept the sun off of the back of your neck and, and your ears and it kept you from getting burned and um, the cool part about it was I marked how many days I was actually in the desert on the side of it um, during Desert Shield I put all the days here and then for Desert Storm I put the days here so for me to mark each one of the different operations that we were in you know that was something wonderful um, 211 days marked out right there <laughs> um, and that was our floppy hat that we call it. and this was the shirt that we had to wear we uh, called it the chocolate chip because of what <laughs> the way it looks it looks like chocolate chip um, and if you notice there's no stripes on the sleeve and that was because our uniforms at that time we had what's called an air crew patch that we put over this velcro area and that had our name our rank our unit and uh, what branch of service we were in we were in the Air Force so that way we had that all that information right there and then that way if something you know it wasn't going to happen but if something bad happened to us they could take that patch and that was how they knew who we were um, of course the pants to go with it about the same thing uh, chocolate chip pattern but this was one of the one unique things that nobody ever thought about bringing a, a field jacket they're like, we're going to the desert. It's hot. Night. Well, when that sun goes down, you're 145 in the shade during the day. When the sun goes down, it drops down to 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. You're thinking 80 degrees is kind of warm. But when you're talking about a 65 degree difference in temperature, you need a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, this was the jacket that they issued to everybody. It's called the Night Desert Parka. And with the liner and everything, it keeps you very warm. Um, they made it easy on us for the gas mask type uh, environment because they put stretchy stuff on the sleeve. So when we had to put our gloves on, we could just pull the sleeve back over the gloves and it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then the hood, we had the hood. It, that went over the top of it so in case the wind storms came in you could tie that thing in nice and tight and uh, you know have it drawn in kind of tight for you so that the sand storms don't get to you and it had pockets for us to be able to get into our uniform oh. you know, so overall it was it was an outstanding jacket I mean, it kept us very warm and and the uh, the pattern was like a camouflaging pattern that we would need at night time. So that's why they call it the Night Desert Parka. Because uh, this pattern would break up your your shape to where they couldn't tell what that was, you know, in the desert. Instead of, hey, look, there's a human silhouette walking around. Uh, this actually broke it up at night. So. Overall, um, I wouldn't trade any moment or any time, uh, good or bad, that I've had throughout the 13 years. Um, it's gave me a lot of good experiences. I uh, have a wonderful uh, family that, that has supported me the whole way. I have two great sons. Uh, Lucas is 20, actually he will be two years old in five days. Um, and my oldest son, Josh, he will be nine years old in March. So overall, I have two wonderful sons and a great family and a lot of great friends and experiences along the way. So you did marry? I was married and got divorced. Okay. And so, I mean, overall, it's been a great experience. Is there anything else? Oh, I'm going to go to the after one. You came back and you... How long have you been back? Okay, um... Desert Storm...
ended in 91. And right after I got back, about October of 91, I went to Korea, to 92. So uh, I, I re-enlisted in the Air Force at that time, and that is when I decided I was pretty much going to make the Air Force my career. Um, so I've only got seven years of retirement, so I'm going to stick with it. Uh, and I joke about that now with a lot of the, uh, the people that I talk to that are interested in, in joining the Air Force, and I tell them, you know, I originally signed up for four years to try it out, and I'm still trying it out, and it still ain't all that bad. You know, so uh, it's kind of a way of me to joke around and let them know, hey, Air Force is a great career. Um, I, I constantly look at the local uh, job opportunities and, and know that whenever I do decide to get out of the Air Force, due to my Air Force training and my job experience, I will not have a problem getting a job. Uh, in the civilian sector, but yet what makes me stay in and want to go to retirement is the fact that I do see a lot of other people struggling uh, with the fact that, that they're having a hard time getting those jobs, and, and a lot of jobs are, are they, they, the economy has just changed so much that, you know, you may have a job today and then tomorrow they're like, sorry. Uh, and that's one of the things that I loved about the Air Force was the job security. Whenever I signed up for six years, as long as I didn't do anything silly, um, <laughs> I had a job for six years. As long as, you know, I, I didn't mess up. And that's all on me. It's not like, you know, the Air Force is going to say, hey, sorry, we got too many people, we need to let you go. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So uh, for me to have that safety zone and for me to be able to to have a family and know that my family is going to be taken care of uh, through my job security and through all of my benefits, the medical and the dental benefits, it's just a wonderful job to have. Uh, Dan, any uh, experiences recruiting that you think are funny? Or <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and how, how? I'm, I'm fairly new uh, to recruiting for the Air Force. Uh, but I've already had a, a lot of uh, good experiences and the fact that um, I've been able to share uh, my experiences that I've had in the past 13 years with all of the people that are interested in the Air Force and I can personally say that every person that I've ever talked to I've had something that I could tell them that I've experienced. Um, if they're interested in travel, I can tell them all about travel. Um, if they're interested in the college programs, I can tell them all about the college programs. So pretty much everything that the Air Force offers, I've had a chance to experience. Um, recreation. I never knew how to play paintball. I got to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, I was playing paintball. I loved it. Um, a lot of the different things, scuba diving in Okinawa, I mean, a lot of the different things that I've learned how to do, I've learned in the Air Force um, because I've had that opportunity to be able to do that. Snow skiing in Denver, Colorado, can't beat it. <laughs> it's pretty good snow skiing. Um, I've been to Las Vegas. I've been to Alaska. I've been to California. I mean, it just totally different uh, places that have allowed me to experience all this. I'm now up here in New York. I got a trip planned hopefully this summer to where I can go see Niagara Falls. Never thought I'd ever be able to do stuff like that. How, how are the recruits that the type of young man and young woman is, is coming in? Um, overall you we... Some college people, some Overall, we, we talk to many different types. Um, some have went through the college experience. Uh, some did the same thing that I did. You know, they checked into it at high school and they've signed up through high school. 
Um, overall, uh, you can't really narrow it down to one person. I mean, it, it's more of a, a broad spectrum of how many different types of people there are out there. Uh, and that's part of the challenges of doing this job. Do you look for anything particular in a person? Um, basically, what we try to do is through talking to them, uh, we want to try to find out what their future plans are. And whatever their future plans are, granted, the Air Force is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to help them out with their future plans. But that's why I ask them what their future plans are and what their dreams are and what their hobbies are so that I can tell them what the Air Force is going to offer. Um, a lot of the great benefits and opportunities the Air Force has may be one of the things that they're looking for. Um, and with the many different things that we offer, uh, it's kind of hard to beat. I mean, it's really, it's really hard to beat. So, uh, I think you've pretty much told us how, how your experience influenced your life. <laughs> it seems to have changed your life. Yes, ma'am. What are some of the life lessons you've learned or philosophy that you want to pass on and how you change? Oh, wow. In looking um, at things, pretty much. How I've changed at looking at things uh, through my experience in the Air Force is whenever I was growing up, I always, I always seen something that I wanted to do and didn't know how to do it. And that was part of that that um, that gap or that, that uh, wall that would get built up. That you know I, I didn't know how to do it. Well, that's part of my experience in the Air Force is I've learned how to ask. You know, go out there and, and find out how to do that. Um, if I want to go ice skating, I'll pick up the phone and call somebody now. Uh, whereas before, you know, I was kind of shy. I was I was a shy kid growing up, so I was more apt to asking a friend, you know, hey, where do you go ice skating at? You know, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't the type to to go ask somebody that I didn't know how to do something, um, and it's it's broken me of my shyness, um, as you could tell today by this interview <laughs> that you know. I, I'm not bashful about sitting here and telling my life experiences. Um, I've had to do a lot of speeches. Uh, right now in my job, I do a lot of classroom presentations where I sit there and I tell students what I've experienced, what the Air Force has to offer. And in high school, you couldn't drag me up in front of four people, much less 50, 60 people. So uh, just those experiences have changed me a lot, have given me a lot of good uh, life experiences. Uh, as far as my philosophies on life, uh, live every day, day by day, but look at your future too. Um, throughout high school, everybody looks at, you know, gee, I don't want to go to school tomorrow, or I, I, I really, you know, not looking forward to tomorrow or, or, or something like that, and you can't you can't do that. If you want to meet your future goals, you have to look at it, what can I do tomorrow that will get me to what I want to do in my future? And that's something that I've, I've always looked at that, you know, have you thought about tomorrow? You know, everybody's so focused on what they're doing today, but have you thought about tomorrow? You have to. Otherwise, you're not going to make it through the day. Because what you do today greatly impacts what's going to happen to you tomorrow, too. So, um, overall, uh, my major philosophy on life is whatever you want to do, go do it. Don't sit there and wonder if you can do it or when you're going to do it. Just go do it. Because if it weren't for that, um, I would have missed out on a lot of good stuff. And I would have, I would have not been able to um, 
go do the things that I've been able to do. And a lot of my family that has passed away, I was able to go up and tell my supervisor, hey, I want to be there, you know? And um, I was able to be a pallbearer for a lot of that. And that made me feel good. You know, overall, um, get out there and do it. <laughs> You want to add anything else? Anything we didn't cover that you thought oh, you wow. want to talk about? Um, you got time. Overall, um, I think I've covered pretty much everything. Um, there's a lot of little stories that I could tell. Give them a couple. But <laughs> Just a couple. <laughs> um, I, I've always said the little stories are for the memories between me and the people that it happened to. Oh. So, um, as far as any little stories that I could probably tell here today, <coughs> excuse me, um, would have to be the uh, the funny times that that I've seen throughout my career of um, just people having a good time. I mean, um, we're big pranksters <laughs> in, uh, in my old job, munitions, and uh, we pulled a lot of stuff on each other, uh, and that makes a, that, that breaks up the, uh, the seriousness and the, the monotony of, uh, of the serious job. I mean, we got a serious job to do in the Air Force, and you can't be serious all the time. You, you got to have a little bit of fun. So, um, there are times that, that we would scare each other. Um, there are times that just out of nowhere, one of your buddies would just run up and tackle you, you know, <laughs> just playing around. Um, uh, I remember uh, one instance in uh, Okinawa while we were doing our uh, class dive. We were teaching some of the students how to how to control your uh, what we call our buoyancy, the, how to be able to go deeper in the water or shallower in the water, uh, using air being inflated into your buoyancy control vest. Um, and me and him were pretty much doing synchronized swimming at about 60 foot while all the students were watching, and uh, there was one point where. He went inverted upside down and was actually like this, <laughs> facing me. He, I mean, I could see his goggles here and the rest of his body was going up that way. And he was making silly faces at me and I was making silly faces at him. And then we pretty much stayed just like that but spun around and uh -huh. went inverted the other way to where I was now upside down. And it was just wonderful to sit there and, and show those students that with a lot of practice and control, you can do and have some fun. At the same time, you're doing something serious and that you're learning how to better your control so that whenever you do want to go over and see some coral, you don't accidentally hit the coral. You know, you, you can actually hover the coral and then come back off of the coral and actually have the experience of being able to see it up close without damaging the coral. And, and that's just some of the things that we do. Um, we have fun. And like I was saying about the uh, ski trip in Denver. I mean, uh, Las Vegas. We went downtown Las Vegas and we uh, seen concerts in the uh, the different um, casinos. I've been to Reno. We went downtown Reno. Um, I've actually been around uh, some of the movie sites. Um, like whenever they did the movie Shag and Myrtle Beach, I was actually downtown watching them film it. Um, the movie Glory in Savannah, Georgia, you know. Um, just all the different fun things that, that, that we could do because of, you know, our ability to be able to go out there and, and see the different countries and, and see the different experiences. Just got to have fun overall. Even though we were doing a serious job and we actually got the job done, 
as you could tell, you know, I, I did above and beyond my job, but I also had fun. It was a great experience. Okay. Sammy? That's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you did about 90 minutes, but... Whoops, that's not right.